week, just to remind us, it's not going to let us go. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to get a lot worse before this gets better. But I'm glad everyone got here safely, and be safe out in those roads. Uh, slow down, and uh, hope you all had snow tires on. Uh, announcements today. Uh, our coffee hour, our Zoom coffee hour has continued. Finally, this week coming up, I don't have a doctor's appointment, so I can join in. So, Wednesday is at 10.30. Tune in. Like I say, we'll send you the invite. All you have to do is click that button, and it brings up the uh, Zoom on your computer. If you need us to come out and set your computer or tablet up for Zoom, let us know, and we'll come out uh, through the week, and we'll get it set up for you so you can just run. Um... The Christmas Bureau is running Collection Week this week. Now today is White Gift Sunday. Traditionally we'd be collecting uh, gifts for the Christmas Bureau, but the Christmas Bureau again is only taking financial donations. So if you want to make a donation to the Christmas Bureau, just mark it on your envelope and leave it in the basket at the back and we'll separate out the Christmas Bureau stuff from our stuff and we'll get it up to the Christmas Bureau this week. Uh, this, this year, it is St. James is the hosting church for the Christmas Bureau. So they will be taking donations through the week. If you want to make a check, you make the check out to the Family Assistance Fund uh, instead of uh, Christmas Bureau or CAS. So it's the Family Assistance Fund for that one. Um, oh, we got calendars. Many thanks to Connie for working diligently to put it together. Calendars are for sale. Uh, see Connie at the back uh, on your way out or let people know that we have them. Uh, $15 each, beautiful calendar. People that put the photos in are people from the community, people from our church. Uh, beautiful photos, really well done. Uh, looks really nice. And important dates there already pre-printed on the calendar. So get your calendar and uh, stay in touch with everything that we have coming up. Uh, what else do I have? Uh, there's a food bank challenge for the Christmas season. Uh, these forms are downstairs on the way in. Uh, each day, purchase a certain item there, and then on the 15th, you can bring them all in and we'll get them off to the food bank. Uh, the need is greater than ever for uh, food for the food bank. Uh, and, uh, what else do I have? Starting tomorrow, this is the start of Advent. So starting tomorrow, I will be doing a daily devotional online on our Facebook page. It'll be just a short little five minute talk. Give us something to think about through the day or through the week or through the month. Uh, just short, uh, I'm hoping to have it up by 10 o'clock every morning. It will run from Monday to Saturday. And Sunday will be our normal service. So that's starting tomorrow, our daily devotionals for Advent. Uh, next Sunday is Communion Sunday. So come on out, uh, we're gonna be doing communion there with the communion packs that we've done in the past. Also, if you're at home, uh, have some grape juice or some juice or some bread, and we'll share the Lord's Supper together as we go through it. And then two Sundays from now, we're gonna have our service of singing Christmas carols and hymns. So next week, I will put out a tray at the back or a bowl at the back and some paper where you can just write out your favorite Christmas carol. Uh, it doesn't have to be a Christmas hymn. If it's Snoopy Christmas, put it in there, and we'll see if we can get the music, and we'll sing it. Uh, just something to lighten up the uh, spirit. And it's also, remember, wear your goofy Christmas sweater uh, day, too. So the louder the sweater, the better it is. I think everyone knows what I'm likely to come up with every year. Uh, what else do we have? Oh, and the fourth Sunday in Advent on the 19th, we have a baptism coming up here at Northside. So that'll be a nice way to end our year out with a baptism. So put that date in your calendar that you're gonna buy on your way out, right? Uh, baptism on the 19th. For Christmas Eve services, uh, we had a meeting on Thursday with the pastoral charge, and we are gonna hold two separate Christmas Eve services uh, just to keep our numbers down. The Northside service will be at 6 p.m., and the cabin service will be at 7.30 p.m. And then on Boxing Day, which was a so Sunday, we will not be holding any regular service here. So 
enjoy your Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, and uh, you won't feel rushed to get out to church on a busy day. Uh, I will do a short message there on that day, which will load up onto our Facebook page. Uh, point set is, I think the deadline for point set is passed on, or will you take orders today? Today is the last day to get your point set is. That's the man to see down there. Uh, for that challenge. And I believe we have a birthday coming up. Whose birthday? Yesterday. Oh, yesterday. Janie? Yes. Oh, Janie, happy birthday. Bless you. Can we do a quick happy birthday? Happy birthday. God bless you, Janie. Uh, it's good to be able to sing birthdays again. I, we missed that for the last year and a half. Okay, I think that's everything on my list. Is there anything else we need to share with each other before we start? No? Okay, well, this is the start of Advent, so we're gonna start with lighting our Advent candles. The Gospel of John speaks of Christ as the true light coming into the world. In commemoration of that coming, we light candles for the four weeks leading up to Christmas and to reflect on the coming of Christ. It is significant that the church always uses that language, the coming of Christ, because it speaks of a deep truth. Christ is coming. Christ is always coming always entering a troubled world, a wounded heart. So we light the first candle, the candle of hope, and dare to express our longing for peace, for healing, and for the well-being of all creation. Advent is here, and the wait for the birth of Christ has begun. As we light the first candle, we are reminded of God's promise of the Savior. As it is written by the prophet Jeremiah, the days are coming, surely, says the Lord, when I fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah. In those days and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. And this is the name by which it will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Together we anticipate the day is coming. Holy God, you have promised to bring salvation and justice to your creation. As we wait for the arrival of the Savior, may we live as those who have already been saved by your grace. May we share the grace, may we share that grace with others. Amen. And we're going to sing verse 1 of A Candle is Burning. Voices United, number 6. Verse 1 only.
take time in the busyness of the season for quiet reflection. For the light of God's love is discernible everywhere. We will let ourselves be surprised by wonder. Set aside time to offer quiet thanks. The good, the good news of Advent is that Christ is coming. Christ is always coming. We will let ourselves be guided by his ministry. We will go forth from this place in hope. In keeping with recent United Church practices in fulfilling the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Report, we in the United Church of Canada recognize the Aboriginal peoples of this land, the Inuit and the Métis, as the original stewards of this land. We are all people of these treaties signed in good faith. Let us live up to the spirit of these treaties in all our undertakings, respecting the land and learning from these peoples. The spectacular mercies of the Advent Christ be with you all. That we may be glad wherever the Lord Jesus comes to us. That we may honor God together with our brothers and sisters of every race. And our hymn of gathering this morning is hymn number two. Come now, long expected Jesus. Hymn number two. Let us continue in prayer. God, our holy friend, you have pledged to complete the love ministry which Christ Jesus began, making all things young again. Enable us during this Advent season to get ready for the celebration of the coming of Lord Jesus, that he may find us watching eagerly, serving gladly and loving wholeheartedly. To the glory of your name, amen. Because most of us are slow learners, lukewarm believers, or ex yet excuse makers, let us pause, take stock, and confess our sins and mistakes. Let us pray. Because we have sometimes busy ourselves religiously, as if the success of God's kingdom depends solely on us, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Because sometimes we opt out and with a piety that leaves everything up to God and the holy angels, Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Because your mercy is over all your works, and your grace is greater than our pride, foolishness, and weakness, Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Have pity, loving God, 
on our little lives and our errant ways. Forgive our sins, which are many and diverse. Correct the distorted view we have of ourselves and the world that leads us from discouragement to hope, to, to hope and restore within us a passion to seek your will and do it. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. My friends, stand up straight. Lift up your downcast eyes. Your redemption is at hand. In Christ Jesus, our sins, our mistakes are forgiven, and the final victory is assured. Thanks be to God. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and to all people. May we be free from the shame of the holy at the coming of the Lord Jesus with all his saints. Amen. And we're going to sing a nice little friendly children's tune, 340. Jesus, friend of little children, 340. favorite movie of mine, and I think of many people, is The Sound of Music. How many people have watched it once, if not 20 times? Love the music of it. There's one particular song in there, My Favorite Things, and there's a line out of that song that really sums up today, White Gift Sunday. As it goes, brown paper packages tied up with strings. These are a few of my favorite things. Here we are in the lead up up to Christmas time and we're buying packages, presents, and we're wrapping them all with some brightly colored paper. Those trees in our houses there are probably already starting to accumulate presents around them. And wrapping them there with bright paper, it just adds to the beauty and the mystery of the season. It's a sight that every child likes to see. All those presents just wrapped up with bright colored paper. Now imagine if you had all those bright packages under the tree and there was one wrapped with just brown paper and tied up with a string. What if that package was addressed to you? Would that be one of the first presents you open Sunday Christmas morning? I don't think so. Like we like those bright ones because we think what's inside there must be really important if it's enough to warrant their bright colored paper. Well, that was the idea behind White Gift Sunday. Back in 1904, the wife of a Methodist preacher, pastor, she felt that nobody should feel embarrassed because they couldn't afford a nicer present and to wrap it up with nice paper. Some people who couldn't afford much, they just wrapped it up with paper bags there that they accumulated from the stores. And that was the brown paper package. They tied it up with string because they didn't have tape. That was the idea behind it. So nobody would feel left out. Nobody would feel embarrassed because they couldn't afford the nicer looking paper. When you think about it, that's how God's great gift for us came. Not wrapped in fancy paper but born or born into a rich household, household, but born to a simple virgin and a poor carpenter. And that's why a lot of people also miss out on that gift that God sent to us. They see God's gift wrapped in brown paper 
and they think, no, it can't be anything important in there. But God's gift came to us in that form of that child, Jesus, his only son. His gift was the greatest gift ever given to humanity, the gift of salvation. It wasn't wrapped in pretty paper. It wasn't wrapped there looking spectacular, but it was the greatest gift ever because it is our salvation. And that gift was sent to you and to you and to you and to you, to all of us. That gift was addressed to each and every one of us. The Bible tells us that Mary, when she had found out she was to bear God's child, she sang a song. The mighty one has done great things for me, she sang. Well, the mighty one has done great things for each and every one of us. He has sent us his gift, his love, his grace, his salvation. But some people are too busy unwrapping the beautifully gift packages that the world offers that they missed out on that wonderful gift. Maybe because it is wrapped in brown paper and tied up with strings. But yet it's the greatest gift that we will ever receive. The gift of Jesus, the child to come, the child that's always coming. Amen. Let's continue in prayer. Continue in prayer. Most wonderful God, keep us alert to the works around us, that at his coming the Lord Jesus will, will neither find us apathetic nor so frantically busy that we have no time to smell the roses or to have time to talk to a lonely neighbor. Be with us all through this time of coming and give us the patience and the time to spend with our neighbor and show him the love that God has. Amen. Our first scripture reading comes from the prophet Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the good promise I made to the people of Israel and Judah. In those days, at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called, the Lord, our righteous Savior. These are the words of the Lord. And our gospel reading today comes from the gospel according to Luke. There will be signs in the moon, the sun, the moon, and the stars. On earth, the nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. People will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world, for the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud of power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is drawing near. Then he told them a parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees. When they sprout leaves, you can see for yourself and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing drunkenness and anxieties of life. And that day will close on you suddenly like a trap, for it will come on all who live in the face of the whole earth. Be always on watch and pray that you will be able to escape all that is about to happen, and that you will be able to stand before the Son of Man. The Gospel of Christ. Hear what these ancient words are saying to us today. And we're going to sing a short little song, O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Voices United, number one, verses one, two, and six, and seven. One, two, six, and seven.
You know, for centuries, people have speculated when the world was going to end. People come up with calculations and predictions as to exactly when this is going to occur. And there's people out there that have given all their belongings away, gathered at a particular place to wait for the coming of the, the ending of the world and Jesus to return. Well, obviously, the world hasn't ended yet and Jesus hasn't come back yet. Or has he? People still wait. And when one prediction doesn't come true, they find some explanation for it and they set a new date for the end of the world. We look around at the world that we live in. It's full of violence, crime, racial tension. We read about violence, abuse, disasters, and we say, things just can't keep going this way. Something's gotta break. Times of uncertainty and crisis trigger thoughts about the end of time. Well, in our gospel reading today, Jesus is with his disciples in Jerusalem. This would be the start of Jesus' last week on earth. And it was a confusing time for the disciples. They thought once they got to Jerusalem, the center of Judaism, everything would be great. Jesus would establish the earthly, ki the earthly kingdom of God. After all, they walked into Jerusalem to a great parade, crowd singing, welcome to the king. But well, the crowd had slowly turned lukewarm and then went cold, even started to ignore Jesus there. Just like a musical a celebrity who doesn't put a hit out in a year, suddenly they're soon forgotten. But Jesus had upset some people. He upset the religious officials and they were actively plotting, plotting against him. In our story today, Jesus and his disciples had just come out of the temple. His disciples were admiring the temple, building a beauty. You see, the temple had only just recently been restored in the past 30 years. Workers were still putting the final touches on the structure. That temple stood as a beacon on top of a hill in the center of Jerusalem. You couldn't miss the structure no matter which way you came into the city. It just glowed in the sunlight. As that noted Jewish historian Josephus put it, described the temple as a sight to behold. The temple appeared to strangers when they were at a distance like a mountaintop covered with snow. As for parts of it that were not gilded, they were exceedingly white. It shone for the whole countryside around. And as the disciples admire the temple, Jesus tells them, as for the things you see, the days are coming when not one stone will be left upon another. It will all be thrown down. The disciples think unthinkable. That temple was built of stone with such perfection. It was meant to stand and last for centuries. The temple was built to last for generations. It could never be destroyed. Yet Jesus told them that one day that beautiful temple would be nothing more than a pile of rubble. So the disciples asked that question that had been on their minds then, when, this is, when is this going to happen? And every generation since then has asked that question. When will this disaster happen that the end will come? What will be the signs that this is a, about to take place? The disciples want to know when the world is going to start crumbling around them. They want to be ready. But instead of giving them a date and a time, he gives them a warning. Jesus says, Beware that you are not led astray, for many will come in my name and say, I am he. The time is dear. Do not go after them. And Jesus warns his followers not to become too preoccupied with thoughts of a disaster in the future. He wants them, doesn't want them to be led astray by persons making meaningless calculations. He doesn't want them to be paralyzed with fear. Jesus knew that there was still work that needed to be done, and he didn't want people to stop doing the work because they knew the end was coming. Jesus went on to say, when you hear of wars and insurrection, do not be terrified, for these things must take place first. Jesus told him, nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be great earthquakes in various places, famine and plagues, and there'll be dreadful portents and great signs from the heavens. This will be a time of trial, Jesus warns them. And everybody is going to have to face this time of trial. The disciples were not going to be exempt from it. But at the same time, they would not be alone through that time of trial. In times of need, Jesus, Jesus promises them, you will receive strength from beyond. Strength from beyond. Rabbi Harold Kushner reflects on that saying, 
on this strength. As Rabbi Kushner says, I have seen weak people become strong, he writes. Timid people become brave. Selfish people become generous. I've seen people care for their elderly parents, for brain-damaged children, for wives in wheelchairs, for years, even decades. And I've asked myself, where do people get the strength to keep doing that for so long? Where do they get the resources of love and loyalty to keep going? The only answer I can come up with is when we are weary and out of strength, we turn to God. And God renews our strength so that we can run and not grow weary, so we can walk and not feel faint. I remember for 15 years, I was studying towards ministry. I had to work several part-time jobs while doing my studies for an MDiv. I probably worked close to 50 hours a week, did my studies, maintained a part-time ministry at my church as well. And on top of all that, had to maintain a family life. It was a lot going on. And people used to ask me how I got through it, how I did it. It was just so much, it seemed. My answer was, I didn't think about it, I just did it. But looking back, I can see that it was God that gave me the strength to get through another day. And the days rolled into weeks and weeks into months and into years. Without God's support, I know I would not be up here today. And there were people that did try to stop me on the process. In times of persecution, in times of suffering, when our world seems to be crumbling around us, that is our time of our greatest need for strength, to receive strength from beyond ourselves. The world will throw roadblocks in your way. We need that extra strength to get through it. That strength comes from God and God alone. Jesus warns his disciples that the days are coming when it will get tough, but they're not alone, and neither are you and I. Because God is with us, we can carry on even when the world around us seems to be falling to pieces. There were times in the disciples' lives when everything seemed to go wrong. People were rejecting their message. People tried to kill them. There were times when they were at the very edge. They tried to do their best, but no one responded. They were run out of town. They were thrown in jail. Being a follower of Jesus required patience and endurance, and it still does. Bruce Olson tells of an experience there as a missionary in South America. As he said, I got off the plane in Venezuela on a hot August day back in 1962. With only $72 in my pocket, 19 years old, I was alone, unable to speak Spanish, but convinced that God had told me to go to South America to preach to the Indians. He made friends there with some of the natives and learned to speak Spanish. And one day, a respected colleague asked him, have you ever heard of the Moltolin tribe? And then he described a legendary Stone Age tribe that had resisted civilization. No one had ever bothered to learn their language. Few ever entered their territory in return. But Bruce felt his heart stir, and he wrote back and said, My heart, I sank back in awe, and I knew then that those were the people that God wanted me to go to. But it wasn't an easy job to get to those people. He says, we chopped our way through the jungle for seven days, he remembered. And as they were walking through the jungle, an arrow pierced my thigh. I fell to the ground. And out of the jungle stepped five squat men with bows, short cropped hair. He had met the Metalone people, he writes. And they dragged me to my feet, and I limped with them to the village. As the day passed, my wounds festered. I developed amoebic dysentery and began to hemorrhage blood, he recalled. And things would get much worse before they got better. The period that followed was a nightmare of pain and trial, he remarked. I continued to try to bring God's love to those people. And for two weeks, he lay in that hut, dying. Finally, a couple of the natives carried him out to a clearing where a helicopter picked him up and took him to a hospital where he was told he'd be at least six months in recovery. He would never be able to go back to a jungle climate. But as he said, I had a deepening peace in my heart. God had brought me to the Metalones. God would help me to continue. And within three weeks, he was back up river, heading up to the tribe where he'd left. And he lived with that tribe for four years, continuing to introduce the people to the love of God. Where do we get the ability to keep going when everything appears to be going wrong? 
It comes from God and God alone. In times of need, we need to receive that help from beyond. And through that, we can persevere and achieve our goals. And that brings me to a final point that needs to be said. As followers of Jesus, we are not required, we're not expected to just sit by and do nothing while we're waiting for Christ to return. While we wait, we need to do our work. There is work to be done. All kinds of work. Loving work, encouraging work. Just to give you an example, Douglas Maurer was a 15-year-old from Missouri. He was feeling sick for several days. He had a temperature ranging from 103 to 105. He was suffering flu-like symptoms. Well, his mother, Donna, eventually took him into the emergency room where blood tests revealed that he had leukemia. The next 48 hours, he endured blood transfusions, spinal and bone marrow tests, chemotherapy. And for five days, his mother stayed with him in that hospital room. The doctors were quite frank about the disease. They told him over the next three years, he was going to endure chemotherapy. He'd lose his hair. His body would likely blow. Upon learning all that, he became very depressed. Well, on the, one of the first days in the hospital, he asked his mother, I thought you get flowers when you're in the hospital. Well, one of his aunts called a florist there in St. Louis. His aunt wanted the sales clerk to be aware that who the flowers were for. She said, I want this planter to be especially attractive. It's for my teenage nephew who's suffering from leukemia. The sales clerk said, okay, I'm gonna add some fresh flowers to, the, to brighten it all up. When the floral arrangement arrived at the hospital, he opened the first envelope and read it. It was from his aunt, wishing him well in his recovery. And then he saw a second note. The clerk herself had put a note in there and he read that note. It read, Douglas, I took your order. I work at Bricks Forest. I had leukemia when I was seven years old. Today I am 22. Good luck because my heart goes out to you. Sincerely, Laura Brady. When he read that card, his face just lit up. And for the first time he had been diagnosed in hospital, he had inspiration. He walked, he, he had talked to so many doctors and nurses over the past weeks, but that one card was what it took to cheer him up and give him hope that he was gonna beat that disease. Often, it's the little extra things that we do that can make a difference in the lives of somebody around us. The loving things, the encouraging things. Whether the world comes to, to an end today or a billion years from now, we wanna be found not sitting on a rooftop waiting for the end to come, but ministering to God's children, doing the work that God needs us to do. And sometimes we need that spirit of strength that only God can give us to carry on in that work. And that strength can come from any direction, but the ultimate source of that strength is from God himself. We can go on if the world is falling apart around us like the temple did crumbling down. Why? Because God is with us. We've been promised strength from beyond. Strength not only to endure, but to strength to do those loving things, those encouraging things those things that God has called us to do in his name. We just need to do it. Amen. Let us continue in prayer. Dear Lord God, help us to look down the road, to keep this present moment with all its trouble and all its joys in context, to remember that Christ is coming again just as surely as he came the first time. Help us, Lord, to look forward in hope and to live now in peace. Lord, hear our prayer. Lord, as we enter this season of Advent, as we prepare for Christmas, let this be a season that is more than just hustle and bustle. Make it for us more than a time of buying and selling, more than a time of worrying and, and of celebrating. Make it for us a time of true blessedness, a time in which we pray and share your love with others, a time in which we turn to your word and speak hope to those who despair, in a time in which we stand with our heads high and our hands out to help others find the meaning of a world gone mad. 
Lord, hear our prayer. We pray, O oh God, that you would move in the lives of those who feel that no light can shine in their darkness, in the hearts of those who are depressed, in the mind and spirit, and in the bodies and souls of those who are sick and suffering and alone. Be too with those who are oppressed and afflicted, because they bear your name, and, and with all who share un, who suffer unjustly in this world. Lord, hear our prayer. Strengthen too, O Lord, and bless those whom we may hold before you now in our hearts, and lift up before you with our lips. Today, we especially hold in our prayers those that we name now in the silence of our hearts, and those whose names are known to you alone, O Lord. All these things we have prayed, and that we will, and we will continue to pray. We pray to you, O God, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, who has died and who has risen, and who will come again. Glory be to his name. Amen. And now I invite you all to join in the prayer that Jesus taught us as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we'll say a prayer over the gifts that you left on your way in. O oh God, you provide us with the gifts to be offered to you in your name. Accept them as a sign of our loving service. In your mercy, grant that the offerings you enable us to make may obtain for us an enduring reward. We ask this through Jesus, our divine brother and friend. Amen. And we're going to close out with hymn 639. One more step along the road I go. 639.
And now, that peace that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge of God's total and inclusive love, shown to us when he sent his son Jesus to be one of us, to carry us through the hard times and need us, and our needs wherever was needed. And that same Jesus is still saving and redeeming broken hearts and lives to this very day. And the blessing of God, the Creator, the Sustainer, and the Redeemer be with you all and remain with you always. Amen. <laughs>